Hello, and welcome to this first video in our study of the book of Isaiah. If you haven't yet received your student guide, your workbook, your worksheet, whatever you want to call it, um, you may want to stop this video and watch that later. Your worksheet is going to look like this, and uh, we've got the first three lessons ready, so we'll send those out. In the future, my hope is to be able to uh, have uh, lessons written and prepared in advance so we can send out four at a time. So basically, you'll receive these once a month. Well, welcome to our time together. Uh, I read recently about an experience that happened during the Second World War, the uh, Allied aircraft manufacturers and uh, were working with the, the soldiers and, and the Air Force at that time and they were studying uh, bombers that had come back from missions and where they were getting shot up and somebody said well we ought to reinforce those sections of the aircraft um, because uh, we know that that's where the enemy's rounds are landing but then somebody else had a contrary viewpoint and they said, but what about the planes that didn't make it back? We've had no chance to study them. And if we understood this data in a different way, we would say that um, these planes have shown where you can get shot and still survive. The other planes may have shown us differently. And so instead they decided to reinforce the other areas of the aircraft places in which the surviving aircraft had not been shot on the basis of uh, the idea that um, the, the uh, non-surviving aircraft in a way were telling a story. So that's a, an example of a, a contrary way of thinking about things. And um, I think lesson one of Isaiah chapter one it, the prophet is inviting us to do some similar thinking. He certainly was inviting the people of Judah to do some um, backwards uh, thinking, not, not, uh, not morally, but, but intellectually, to, to look at their situation and, and instead of thinking that they were right with God, which they weren't, um, that their covenant relationship with God was going to keep them from suffering any harm, which it wasn't, um, that they should instead uh, hear God's voice in his prophecy to them. So with a, after a prayer, we're going to get right into it. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time together. Thank you for your word to us through the prophet Isaiah. And let us have open minds and hearts to... Uh, reconsider uh, what we might have thought previously and to hear in this passage your call to repentance. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, um, let's start by uh, opening our Bibles. I'm going to start by turning the ringer off on my phone, or try to. Um, there we go. Um, with Isaiah chapter 1. Now you can sit down and read this passage through in its entirety, and I suggest that you do so. We're going to kind of read a little bit and then explain a little bit, take it in parts. So, chapter 1, verse 1, the vision concerning Judah and Jerusalem. So here's the first question I ask on page 1. What is the subject of Isaiah's vision? He identifies it here for us as concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Now, uh, having said that, the first part of this uh, prophecy is actually directed to the, their neighbors to the north and their kindred in the um, nation of Israel. But the focus and the intended audience of Isaiah's prophecy is the nation of Judah and particularly the leadership and the people in Jerusalem. All right, that Isaiah son of Amos, 
And, and so the next question is, what do we know about Amos? And we don't know anything, really. The name means powerful or brave. And he is not to be confused with the prophet Amos, A-O-M-O-S. This is A-M-O-Z. He's not to be confused with that man. Um, they're entirely different people. Some people have suggested that Isaiah had easy access to the leadership of Jerusalem because his family was of noble blood. But there's nothing in the book itself that gives us that information. Continuing in verse 1. During the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. These are kings, excuse me, that reigned over the southern two tribes. And we know a fair amount about these men. Uzziah um, is uh, a name that means might of Jehovah. And he was basically a good king, but he did not remove the high places where idol worship was conducted. So you kind of give him maybe a, a passing grade or a middling grade as a king. Um, he was followed by Jotham. And um, when we look at the reigns of these kings um, in this timeline, uh, you notice that these uh, lines are jagged and so the reigns overlap at times. And that's because, uh, like as in the case of Uzziah, um, Jotham, uh, his son, was uh, reigned with him or was co-regent uh, for a, a number of years. Looks like about 10 years. And then he reigned by himself for a little while, and then he shared his reign with Ahaz. So that's the reason um, that, that these are, are described in that way. Uh, that's not the kind of thing that we're used to but it certainly happened in the history of Judah. Now, uh, Jotham, same as his father Uzziah, uh, was a pretty good guy, uh, but he still did not remove the idolatrous spots on the high places. The name Joth Jotham means Jehovah, or Yahweh, is upright. They're followed by Ahaz. The name Ahaz means he has sustained, but Ahaz was an awful idolater. The Bible tells us that he even made his own children walk through fire as a means of, of uh, worshiping their false god. He, he was a child sacrificer. He is followed by Hezekiah, whose name means Jehovah strengthens. Hezekiah is one of the best kings of the nation of Judah a reformer, uh, a great and prosperous king. Back to verse 2 now. Hear, O heavens, listen, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. Now starting here in verse 2, we have kind of courtroom scene being set up. And the uh, creation itself is being called as the jury, as the witnesses. God is the prosecutor, and Israel, as, as we'll see, is the defendant. And so this courtroom scene is, is being set up here. What is the charge? The charge is rebellion and lacking understanding. Now, my question on page one is, um, how does Isaiah characterize Judah's behavior? I don't think it really matters a whole lot whether we say this is directed at Israel primarily or Judah primarily, this first section of verses, uh, say, two to seven. Um, but instead, it's to God's people. And God accuses them of rebellion. Now, I reared children and brought them up but they have rebelled against me. First thing God says. Verse 3, the ox knows his master and the donkey his owner's manger, but Israel, now here's where we have Israel named specifically, does not know my people do not understand. So we have the sin of a rebellion mentioned in verse 2. Then in verse 3, the prophet goes on to say, Look, 
even a dumb ox, and you've heard that expression used of someone dumb as an ox. Um, here's maybe where it came from. Uh, and a donkey, certainly not a, a great intellect, knows where it lives. Um, so uh, the prophet is really being very harsh here in condemning them, saying that they, they know even less than an animal knows, um, that, that they did not recognize and know that, that God is their God. And uh, even these beasts, uh, in a sense, know better than they do. Now we go to verse 4. A sinful nation, a people loaded with guilt, a brood of evil doers. Um, children given to corruption, they have forsaken the Lord, they have spurned the Holy One of Israel and turned their backs on him. So the question on page one is, what terms does God use for Judah's sin, or the sin of Israel, sin of this people? Sinful, guilt, evildoers, given to corruption, turned away from God. The Hebrew language has a great number of words that describe sin and uh, they're being employed here. Uh, this is very harsh condemnation, and um, they, they, uh, right here from the beginning, the prophet is pulling no punches and sparing no uh, terms. He's not gonna sugarcoat this in any way, shape, or form. They have simply and completely abandoned uh, their trust in God. Let's go on to verse 5, where the, the prophet Isaiah asks, Why should you be beaten any more? The question I ask on page 1 is, who's been beating on Judah? Well, I think, I think there's two possible answers. One is, uh, immediately, and in the, in the physical world, it would be Assyria had been uh, making war against Israel and Judah. Babylon would eventually be Judah's conqueror. So those pagan nations and, and probably others. But scripture tells us that ultimately it's God who uses these pagan nations to discipline his people. And so the beating, in, in a way, uh, refers to God's discipline. And they are so stubborn. They are so stiff-necked that even though they received this beating, uh, they did not turn to God. Um, look, at, um, look at verse 6. From the sole of your foot to the top of your head, um, you, there is no soundness, only wounds and welts and open sores not cleansed or bandaged or soothed with oil. And there is a, a story, uh, there was a story told in ancient times of a, a scribe who had been uh, repeatedly guilty of crime and, and received repeated beatings from, a, from the police. And until finally, um, he, he had to be disciplined, had to be beaten again, and, and there just was no square inch of unhurt uh, part of his body, and uh, the policeman said, well, where do you want me to beat you? And he said, what's left? The palms of my hands. So this is an image of a, a complete, what we would say, a complete beatdown that uh, he had suffered, and yet um, there is no sense of repentance. There's no uh, acceptance of wrongdoing. Um, instead, they are just sticking with their idolatry. Um, let's continue on. Your country is desolate. Your cities burned with fire. Your fields are being stripped by foreigners right before you. Laid waste as when, I, as when overthrown by strangers. So this is a national image, uh, a, a sort of national version of the personal beatdown described in verse 7. Now, or excuse me, verse 6. 
the daughter of Zion, now here's where it starts focusing on Judah, the daughter of Zion, is left like a shelter in a vineyard, like a hut in a field of melons. I thought those were two particularly interesting images. It turns out that in ancient times there was a custom of building temporary shelters, especially in vineyards or in, in fruit fields, excuse me, where fruit was growing, in order to keep watch over the crop that was ripening to keep human thieves and animal thieves from getting into the developing and ripening crop. Now the thing was, those structures were very temporary and once the harvest had taken place, they were left to fall over uh, again until next season when they needed to be rebuilt. And so Isaiah is using that as a word picture to say that you have come to, to complete desolation. You're like that shack that sits out in the fields that, that uh, is, is, has fallen down and nobody's picking it up because it's not needed any longer. Um, he, he goes on to say in verse 8 that they're like a city under siege. So these are some very desperate times that Isaiah is describing. And then he says in verse 9 something very telling. Unless the Lord Almighty had um, left us some survivors, we would have become like Sodom, we would have been like Gomorrah. In the book of Genesis, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah is described, and we know on the basis of God's uh, dialogue with Abraham that Lot and his family were the only righteous people who were saved out of that catastrophic event. And so Isaiah mentions them here not only as an image of gross evil, and we continue to refer to them in that way. Uh, but um, also as an image of utter devastation. No survivors. There was nobody in the city at the time that the, the hail and fire fell from heaven that survived to tell of that experience. So Isaiah is saying if God didn't save part of us, we would be just like Sodom and Gomorrah. We would be just like them in the degree of their evil, and we would be just like them in the degree of devastation. We'd be totally wiped out. So then he takes that image then in verse 10 and continues with it. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Listen to the law of our God, you people of Gomorrah. Now he's applying it directly to the people of Judah, to his target audience, and he's, he's speaking on God's behalf, and so it's in quotation marks, starting in verse 11. The multitude of your sacrifices. Now stop there for a moment. The multitude of, of sacrifices refers to a, a great amount of ritual sacrifice. So um, God rejected that. He said that, that the people of God were aiming at quantity, not quality. God is not interested in a great big amount of sacrifice. He's interested in sincere sacrifice, genuine worship, not going through the motions, not having a veneer or a facade of piety, but instead having a genuine heart for him, a genuine regret over our sin, a genuine desire to draw near to him. So the kind of, uh, the kind of sacrifice that God wants is a sacrifice that's manifest also outside the place of worship. And as <clears throat> other prophets like Micah and Amos will testify, and also James in the New Testament, that that's a, a lifestyle of justice and righteousness that God wants to bring to pass. So it was a, that God rejected their 
rituals because they were hypocritical. They were false-hearted. How badly did God reject them? Let's go back to verse 11. The multitude of your sacrifices, what are they to me, says the Lord? I have more than enough of burnt offerings, of rams and the fat of fattened animals. And, and the language there is, is meant to give us the sense of, I am sick of it. You know, that, that I, have, I have been filled with that to the point of throwing up. This is a very graphic image. I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. In other words, God is not appeased by these sacrifices. What, what counts is the attitude of the person offering those sacrifices. When you come before me, verse 12, who has asked this of you, this trampling of my courts? So the picture here that Isaiah is painting is that the, the people of Judah are in something of a panic. And they believe that by going into the temple and by making many sacrifices and many offerings to God, that the enemy at their gates will somehow be sent away, that God will be appeased. Now, friends, this is a very superstitious uh, point of view, and it's an act of idolatry. In pagan cultures, people believed that, that, that human beings were created to serve the gods, that, that they needed literally to be fed by human beings, and that human beings were to use sacrifices to appease the gods. That is never the case in Scripture. In fact, the Old Testament law about sacrifice for sin was largely intended for accidental or unintended sin. Not for sins that we commit, but, but sins that we omit, the, the good that we didn't do, that we should have done. The, the sacrifice for sins was the, on the Day of Atonement. And um, God wanted um, an atonement of one's heart before he wanted all of this blood. So, verse 13, he says, stop bringing meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me, new moons, Sabbaths, and convocations. I cannot bear your evil assemblies, your new moon festivals, and your appointed feasts. My soul hates. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. Can you imagine how that sounded in the ears of those people who first heard this? They thought they were buying God's favor. They thought they were getting brownie points from God. And God is through the prophet saying, I'm sick of this. And I'm sick of you. Verse 15, when you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. Even if you offer many prayers, I will not listen. Now here, uh, God is, is, I think, being a little ironic in the sense of, you think of me as just another idol? You think you can appease me as the pagans try to appease their idols? I'm going to respond to you in exactly the same way that those idols respond to those pagans. And that is to be mute, to be unable to speak. I will be deaf because they are unable to hear. I will not see you because they are unable to see I will respond to you as if I were not, just as those idols are not real things. What's the problem? Look at the end of verse 15. Your hands are full of blood. Your hands are full of blood. You're, you're guilty. You are unrepentant and therefore unforgiven. There's still blood on your hands, not just the blood of the sacrifices 
but the blood of their sins, of the blood of the people they have oppressed. And now, then in verse 16, God begins to go in the direction of, okay, how do we fix this? And in verse 16, he says, wash and make yourselves clean. So he's talking there about repentance and about the forgiveness that he wants to give them. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. So on page one, I ask the question, what do they need to do to make their rights right? Wash, take evil out, stop doing wrong, do right, seek justice, as we'll see in just a moment, and also encourage the oppressed, defend the fatherless, plead for the widow. So there's components here of personal righteousness, but there's also components of social justice. And so often in the church, in America anyway, we tend to have one or the other. We emphasize personal righteousness, but we don't give much attention to social justice. Or we have churches that give a lot of attention to social justice, but neglect matters of personal righteousness. Friends, we have to have both in order to be right with God. So, starting in verse, uh, well, let's see, let me finish reading verse 17. Stop doing wrong, learn to do right, seek justice, encourage the oppressed, defend the cause of the fatherless, plead the case of the widow. So now then, in verse 18, God invites his people to do something. What is it? To reason with him. To reason with him. What does he say in verse 18? Come now. Let us reason together, says the Lord. Now, why reason? Well, the author of Romans says that uh, we come near to God by the, the not conforming any longer to the pattern of this world, but instead being transformed by the renewing of our mind. And so there's... Uh, a, a sense in which our capacity for reason, which some people will argue is part of the image of God, given in Genesis chapter 1, um, our capacity for reason needs to be engaged so that we will realize first our sin, that we will realize our need for repentance, and that we will take that step and ask God to forgive us our sins. So we must reason with him. But I think also what's going on here is you remember back in verse 1, we said the courtroom scene was being set up. We had God, the, the uh, prosecutor. We had creation as witness and jury. And then now the defendant is being invited to present his case. Well, of course, he has no case. But let us reason together. Now, what does it go on to say in verse 18? Though your sins are like scarlet, the color of blood, the color of, of guilt, of, of shameful murder, they shall be white as snow. White in the Bible is a symbol of purity. Though they're red as crimson, they shall be like wool, which is saying the same thing two ways. If, verse 19, you are willing and obedient, the promise is you will eat the best of the land. You will eat from the best of the land. But if you resist and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword. So this is Isaiah's way of saying, look, here's your choice. Eat or be eaten. Take hold of the promises of God by your willingness to obey or suffer his just punishment by resisting and rebelling. Let's continue on. For the mouth of the Lord is spoken. The quote ends there. See how the faithful city, 
has become a harlot. This now is in verse 21. She was once full of justice. Righteousness used to dwell in her, but now murderers. Your silver has become dross. Your choice wine is diluted with water. Your rulers are rebels, companions of thieves. They all love bribes and chase after gifts. I thought there was a very good quote from the NIV application commentary, a gentleman by, John, a name, by the name of John N. Oswald, and he wrote, he wrote, he wrote, the prophet describes the present situation in a series of contrasts between what the Lord intended and what he actually got. He intended faithfulness and got harlotry. He intended righteousness and got murder. Instead of silver, he got dross. Instead of pure wine, tasteless dilution. Instead of rulers, he got rebels. Instead of defenders of the helpless, takers of bribes. So God uh, expected these things from his covenant partners and did not get them. And so they have come under his wrath. On page one, I ask the question, what names does God give them? Names harlot, murderers, rebels, thieves. Now, God will not allow that situation to continue. So we come to verse 24, and you see an important word there, therefore. So when we see that, all of the stuff that has come up to that word is now going to explain what follows that word? Therefore, the Lord, the Lord Almighty, the Mighty One of Israel. Now here we have three names of God being used one right after the other. Obviously that's not an accident. What is it meant to portray to us? It's meant to portray to us that, that God is all-powerful. The word Lord means master, and it's used more often in the book of Isaiah than in any other Old Testament book. The second one is Lord Almighty, and that includes or it indicates supreme power, power that is available and works in all circumstances. And then finally, Mighty One of Israel. Now that is a title for God that is uncommon, and in its uh, original language is suggesting of a, a strength, a bull-like strength of, of, um, uh, a, a, of power and uh, ability to bring about the right thing. So these are all very uh, powerful images of God. So how does God intend to fix this. Once again, the quotation starts in verse 24. Ah, I will get relief from my foes and avenge myself on my enemies. Now, who are God's foes? Who are God's enemies? Well, it's not the Assyrians. It's not the Babylonians. Those are his instruments. The people who have made themselves God's foes and, his God's, and God's enemies are God's people who are choosing to rebel against him and who lack understanding of what they're supposed to be doing. And it's a lack of understanding that's brought about by apathy. They don't care. They're following other gods instead. And so God calls them his foes and enemies. And in the New Testament we read, that we cannot be friends with the world without being enemies with God. Paul wrote that while we were still enemies, Christ died for us. So there's a, this very real sense of you're either for me or against me. And in this case, the people of Judah were against him. So how's he going to fix this? I will get relief by, number one, avenging myself. Go to verse 25. I will turn my hand against you. I will thoroughly purge away your dross. 
which is mentioned earlier, and remove all your impurities. I will restore your judges as in days of old, your counselors as at the beginning. Afterward, you will be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city, end quote. So what's God going to do? He's going to avenge himself. He's going to purge their dross. He's going to remove their impurities. He's going to restore their judges. And at the end of that time, the city of Jerusalem will, her new names will re reflect her restored character. City of righteousness and faithful city because they finally got it. They came to understand what it was God wanted them to do, and they did it. So God promises here uh, in uh, verse 27 to redeem them. Look at verse 27. How does he do it? Zion will be redeemed with justice, her penitent ones with righteousness. So God is promising here to, in just, with justice, re, uh, give righteousness to the penitent. Now that's a word that we don't use very often uh, in Baptist circles. Um, penitent uh, means uh, someone who is doing an act of, uh, or acts of penitence. And, and penitence is a kind of moral or spiritual restitution. So let's say I'm playing with a baseball. This is a very common example, I guess. Uh, and I throw it too far or too hard and I break a window. I make restitution to the owner of the window by paying for a new one. Well, it, when we sin against God, there's no loss of, of um, property, but there is a loss of spirituality. And, and one way in which we can restore that imbalance is through acts of repentance or penitence. It demonstrates our regret over our sin and our desire to be restored to God. Now, the Bible does not command repentance. I ask on page one, is penitence still necessary under the new covenant? No, it's not necessary but it may still be in order and certainly is a good thing for us uh, emotionally and intellectually to kind of get our head around. And, and a practice that we can use it to kind of clean out our souls, to wash our hands as Isaiah described earlier. Okay, let's go to verse 29 as we wrap up this first chapter. God speaking again, you will be ashamed because of the sacred oaks in which you have delighted. You will be disgraced because of the gardens you have chosen. Now that sounds kind of strange to our ears. What is it about oaks and gardens that could be so bad? Well, in the practice of idolatry at that time, uh, idol, idol worshipers saw trees as being sacred, and open spaces, especially those on the top of hills, high places, could become outdoor altars and places for worship of those false gods. And so what we said earlier about Uzziah and Jotham not taking down the high places, that's exactly what Isaiah is talking about. Here. They were places where paganism flourished and idolatry um, was conducted. And so uh, when God restores them, they're going to feel differently about those places. They're going to be ashamed of them. Why did we ever do that? Why did we have those places? Why did we worship those false gods? And the, the sacred oaks and the gardens are going to um, be an embarrassment to them. On to verse 30. You will be, now he's going to take that image and, and, and um, intensify it and personalize it. 
you will be like an oak with fading leaves. So the sacred oak becomes an oak with fading leaves, like a garden without water. The garden now is now no longer lush. It's no longer um, beautiful. It's, it's um, in the middle of a drought and parched. The, verse 31, the mighty man will become tender and his work a spark. Both will burn together with no one to quench the fire. Now, at the bottom of page one, I ask the question, how is verse 31 a depiction of judgment day? And the answer to that question is found in 1 Corinthians 3, 11 to 15. Where, and we studied this extensively in Revelation, where the fire uh, is a means of, of trying or, or, or revealing the quality of a person's life. It is a picture, uh, in the Bible, of fire is a picture of trial and purification. And um, it's also a picture of destruction and wrath. But I think what we have here, since God has already promised to restore them, is a, a picture of purification. They, he wanted silver, they gave him dross, but dross can be burned off. It can be the silver melted and that, the, the impurity skimmed off the top. And, and so you need fire to do this. So this is a picture, I believe, not so much of wrath, but a, a picture of discipline. Now, um, for the wicked, um, certainly it is uh, an image of destruction. And I think what God is saying to them and to us is um, we need to keep our focus on the present moment. Yes, we learn from our past. Yes, we think about our future. But we need to be mindful of where we are right now and what we're doing in this present moment moment. Page 2. Chapter 1 of Isaiah sets forth two great themes of this book, the sin of God's people and the promise of God's forgiveness and restoration. So in this sense, it is a very excellent introduction to the 65 chapters that are going to follow. Repentance is the means by which their lurid sins, and I meant that word lurid, it, it Lurid means gross, it means offensive, it means over the top, disgusting. The means by which their awful sins could be made right. Now, this prophecy could have been very negative, and there are certainly parts of it that are uh, very strongly worded, very clear in their condemnation. But there are also promises attached to the condition of repentance, and that's a positive approach. In the application section on page two, I'd like you to think about um, which of the accusations stands out to you, and then think about penitence. Uh, think about your own life and how you are living, and what God, excuse me, may be identifying in you that needs to change. And then also to think about how we witness to people outside our faith. Do we approach them with um, some of these threats of condemnation? No, because these weren't directed to them. These were directed to the people of God. But we do need to let people know that, that there is sin, that there is bad news, in order that they might hear the good news as well. In the review section, we're going to keep track of what we're learning as we go and what each of the... Um, passages that we're going to study or parts of the passages, uh, how they fit in these six big themes of the book of Isaiah. Under the history, we have the history of the prophet himself. We have the history of Judah, the nation, and we could say Israel there just as easy. And then also uh, historical views of Judah's enemies. Under the theology section, what does, Ju what does Isaiah teach us about God? What does Isaiah teach us about Jesus, the Messiah? And what does Isaiah say about the last things? 
So for now, chapter one in its entirety has been covered. If you have any questions or comments, I would appreciate uh, you getting in contact with me or post them on our YouTube site right along with this video. I'd be happy to respond in any way I can. If you haven't yet got your material, please contact the office and we will get it sent to you just as soon as we can. Thank you for joining me in this uh, examination of the prophecy of Isaiah. And may God bless you.